From the classroom to the emergency room, OR and beyond, you're joining Trauma ICU Rounds with your host, Dr. Dennis Kim. Welcome to Trauma ICU Rounds. I'm your host, Dr. Dennis Kim. Today, we'll be continuing our discussion on acute respiratory failure and review key management principles in the recognition and immediate treatment of patients with this life-threatening condition. We'll also discuss some common methods of providing supplemental oxygen therapy. There are three key learning objectives for today's talk. By the end of rounds, you should be able to, number one, appreciate the importance of the primary assessment or ABCDE approach to managing patients with acute respiratory failure, Second, you should have a better understanding of the advantages and disadvantages of different modalities for delivering oxygen therapy from nasal cannula to the non-rebreather mask. Finally, we'll provide a brief overview of optimal oxygen targets in hospitalized patients. So previously, we defined acute respiratory failure as a failure of oxygen or ventilation severe enough to threaten one's life. Further, we defined and classified hypoxemic and hypercapnic respiratory failure on the basis of blood gas and oxygen saturation criteria. For example, we defined hypoxemia as a partial pressure of arterial oxygen less than 55 millimeters of mercury. In the real world, however, this data is usually not readily available when you happen to stumble across a struggling patient on the ward during morning rounds or when you get called to the bedside to assess a patient with SATs in the mid-80s. What am I getting at here? Well, quite simply, in the absence of formal or objective gas exchange data, a thoughtful and focused clinical exam is critical to identifying the presence of acute respiratory failure and increased work of breathing. Further, once we recognize that a patient is in trouble or respiratory distress, whether it be mild, moderate, or severe, Initiation of life-saving therapy, usually in the form of oxygen supplementation, should not be delayed. So for our first objective, we're going to discuss the importance of the primary assessment or ABCDE approach to managing patients with acute respiratory failure. But even before we jump into the primary assessment, I think it's so important to get into the habit of doing two things even before you enter the patient's room or while you're standing at the foot of your patient's bed. First, Scan or eyeball the patient. What you're asking yourself here is, is my patient sick or not sick? Now, the ability to make this determination obviously comes from both time as well as experience, which together translates into a form of pattern recognition. The second thing that you want to scan is the room in order to get a sense of resource allocation. The point of this is to very quickly figure out if you're in over your head, and if you are, This should trigger you to call for help. Resources include not just personnel and their level of expertise, but also availability of equipment such as a crash cart, wall suction, and so on. Just the other day, we were called to a patient's bedside for acute respiratory failure, and the patient obviously required intubation. The patient was in a ward bed where there was no wall suction available, leading to inability to visualize the cords, necessitating us to hunt down a portable suction device. Having made a determination of whether our patient is sick or not sick and having a sense of how much help and support are available, we're then going to proceed with our initial assessment. Similar to trauma, we begin with the ABCDE approach, and this is definitely the time that you want to get a focused history using ideally open-ended questions. And there's so much information to be gained from your patient's responses in the sense that you can ascertain, number one, is their airway patent, yes or no? Number two, are they able to vocalize and carry out a conversation without being dyspneic, which tells you that they at least have sufficient pulmonary reserve to vocalize and speak. Remember, the natural progression for patients with acute respiratory failure typically goes from dyspnea to tachypnea, accessory muscle use, and then vital pump or diaphragmatic failure. The other bit of important information you can gather here is, does my patient have evidence of cerebral malperfusion or is there the presence of hypoxic encephalopathy? And so if your patient is having a normal, oriented conversation with you, you can rule out end organ dysfunction from the standpoint of brain perfusion. But remember, it's not enough to simply identify or recognize problems on the basis of a focused history and physical exam. We want to and must 
institute immediate life-saving therapies even in the absence of a definitive diagnosis. A simple mnemonic I like to share with new house staff and students is VOMIT. You know, every time I see a sick patient, I want to vomit. V stands for vitals, O is for O2, M monitors, IIVs, and T, 12 lead slash therapies. Again, a key point to bear in mind as we proceed with our physical exam is that findings may be nonspecific and often reflect end organ dysfunction, not just of the respiratory system, but of the cardiovascular and neurologic systems as well. So starting with vital signs, we may see a whole host of abnormalities, tachycardia, hypo, or hypertension. In terms of the respiratory rate, this is something that I do want you to pay attention to, particularly if patients are tachypnic. Now, the definition of that, normally we would think that anywhere between 12 to 22 breaths per minute is normal. Certainly by the time a patient has a respirator of 25, and definitely by the time it's greater than 30 breaths per minute, you want to be a bit concerned. Again, this is sensitive but not specific for potential respiratory decompensation. Of course, we want to make sure that we get a pulse oximeter on and the initial O2 sat and the response of the sats to supplemental oxygen are going to be critical in terms of sorting out what the underlying pathophysiology is and whether or not your patients are getting better. Along with vitals, we also want to inspect, auscultate, percuss, and palpate with a focus on the cardiopulmonary systems. Things that we're inspecting include color, appearance, and texture of skin and nail beds, and looking for the presence or absence of central or peripheral cyanosis. Again, just to reemphasize the point, when hypoxemia is suspected on clinical exam and confirmed by your pulse ox or by a blood gas, which again takes a while, even if it is done point of care... The immediate search for underlying causes with simultaneous administration of O2 to correct the oxygen debt is critical. One of the key things I always ask myself when I'm assessing a patient with potential acute respiratory failure is, is there increased work of breathing? And this is where inspection and palpation are critical. And what are we looking for? Well, is there evidence of accessory muscle use, either on inspiration or expiration? Swings in pleural pressures and tidal volumes are ultimately what are going to result in an increased work of breathing and by simple inspection and palpation of cardinal signs like phasic contraction of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, tracheal tug, intercostal or suprasternal retractions, and the presence of diaphoresis should alert you to increased work of breathing and the need to offload the muscles of respiration. Initially, this may be done non-invasively. However, if patients fail to respond, or if patients are already at the point where they've decompensated and manifest evidence of diaphragmatic fatigue or failure, these patients will require intubation and mechanical ventilatory support. So what physical exam findings suggest the presence of vital pump or diaphragmatic failure? Well, one thing to look for is paradoxical abdominal breathing. And this is something that I talk a lot about with the house staff and learners. This happens when the abdomen moves inwards on inspiration instead of outwards. In the normal state, both the chest wall and abdomen on inspiration move out and on expiration move in. When paradoxical abdominal breathing is present, this usually hints or tells you that the inspiratory load has become excessively large due to advancing disease. And the problem with hyperinflation is that ultimately this results in a shorter resting length of the diaphragm, which then is no longer able to generate sufficient tension. As the accessory muscles kick in to help with inspiration, Essentially, the diaphragm gets pulled up by the negative pressure generated by the accessory inspiratory muscles, and this results in that paradoxical inward displacement of the abdomen during inspiration. This finding for me is always significant and usually heralds or signals the need for invasive mechanical ventilatory support. So having discussed the importance of the primary assessment or ABC approach to managing patients with acute respiratory failure, Let's move on to our second objective, which is to discuss and understand key differences between various oxygen delivery systems. So there are really three key oxygen delivery systems, and these include number one, low flow systems, number two, high flow systems, and number three, reservoir systems. 
So let's talk about these individually and then we'll compare and contrast. And also just remember that you can find details outlining the differences between these systems in the show notes at the website www.traumaiCURounds.ca. So regarding low flow systems, this really refers to your standard nasal prongs or nasal cannula, which for whatever reason, every single patient in the hospital has to be on. Now these deliver 100% oxygen at flow rates of about one to six liters per minute. Now you'll notice I said that these deliver 100% oxygen. Well, how can that be? Well, the oxygen coming out of the walls is all 100%. And I think that uh, an area of confusion is that when we talk about the flow rates, people kind of confuse that with the actual inspired FiO2 or oxygen concentration that the patient is receiving. And I can specifically recall as a medical student learning that for every liter of supplemental oxygen above zero, the FiO2 would be anticipated to increase by about 4%. So if normal atmospheric FiO2 is 21%, and I was to put a patient on 2 liters of supplemental oxygen, 2 times 4 is 8 plus 21, gives you an FiO2 of about 28 or 29%. But that's not actually how it works. Ultimately, what will determine the final concentration of inhaled oxygen will be the peak inspiratory flow rate, which Very significantly, at rest, it's about 15 to 30 liters per minute. But in a patient who's in acute respiratory failure or in the throes of septic shock and hyperventilating with a large minute ventilation, these rates can increase upwards of 100 liters per minute. So ultimately, the flow rate delivered by the 100% wall oxygen needs to be adequate enough to meet the high ventilatory demands of our patients. And when patients are sick, you can imagine that nasal cannulas and nasal prongs aren't going to get you very far. In fact, the final FiO2 using these devices typically ends up being somewhere in the range of about 24 to 40 percent. And that brings us to our second oxygen delivery system, which are high flow systems. Essentially, these use either air entrainment masks or heated and humidified oxygen delivered through nasal cannulas, also known as high-flow nasal cannulas. Regarding air entrainment masks, also known as fixed performance venturi masks, these really rely on the venturi effect or side stream entrainment into a moving column of gas and essentially blends a fixed ratio of room air with inspired 100% oxygen to ensure constant rate of oxygen delivery. In fact, of all the systems that we're talking about, this is the only system that will provide patients with a constant rate of oxygen delivery. It will never deliver more, but may deliver less. In terms of clinical situations or specific patient populations in whom we might consider using a Venturi mask, Uh, One great example might be in a patient with an acute COPD exacerbation in whom we're concerned about suppressing their hypoxic drive to breathe. By supplementing these patients overly aggressively with high concentrations of oxygen, the concern is that they may develop a reflexive hypercapnia and CO2 narcosis, which may be potentially life-threatening. Now, there's a lot of debate out there as to whether or not such a phenomenon exists, Some of the increase in the CO2 may be explained by the Haldane effect, whereby the release of carbon dioxide from newly oxygenated hemoglobin occurs, or possibly due to an increase in VQ mismatching and an increase in dead space ventilation. So a variety of mechanisms as to why CO2 levels might go up in patients with COPD who are getting oxygen therapy. Now, if you've ever seen a Venturi mask, you'll notice that they come with color-coded adapters that'll attach to any standard face mask, and these will deliver FiO2s of between 24 to 50 percent, and if you actually look at the adapter, it specifies the required oxygen flow rate to achieve that particular FiO2. Now, high-flow nasal cannulas probably is an episode or round in and unto itself, But essentially, high flow delivers flow rates of between 40 to 60 liters per minute and can deliver FiO2s between 21 to 100%. Unlike cold, non-heated nasal cannula, uh, this heats and humidifies and provides gas that is much more comfortable for patients. Uh, 
The nice thing about HFNC or high flow nasal cannula is that it can better meet the elevated peak inspiratory flow demands of patients, particularly when they're in respiratory distress. Another potential benefit is that we may potentially increase our FRC or functional residual capacity through the delivery of PEEP. Unlike CPAP or BiPAP, which may or may not be well tolerated by patients, high flow nasal cannulas are actually fairly comfortable. And one of the major benefits of high flow is the fact that because we're giving a continuous flow of fresh gas or oxygen at high flow rates, this ultimately will replace or wash out the patient's pharyngeal dead space. That's the old gas that's low in oxygen and high in CO2 that's present at end expiration. And each breath that the patient now rebreathes will be washed out of carbon dioxide and replaced with oxygen-rich gas, improving breathing efficiency. And in a future episode, we'll review some of the evidence or data supporting the use of high-flow nasal cannula post-extubation in an effort to decrease reintubation rates among critically ill ventilated patients. The third oxygen delivery system are reservoir systems, and these vary from standard face masks with or without a bag reservoir. The whole idea behind these systems is they're going to increase the upper airway oxygen reservoir by including the mouth, oropharynx, and volume within the mass, typically anywhere from 100 cc's and up to 500 or 1,000 cc's if there's a reservoir. And again, this is with 100% oxygen. So for a standard face mask, the O2 flow rates typically are on the range of 5 to 10 liters per minute, and uh, the expected FiO2 ends up being somewhere between 35 to 50 percent, but very similar to nasal cannula. This is going to vary significantly based on the patient's ventilatory demand. Regarding masks with reservoir bags, there are really two types. One is a partial rebreather, the other is a non-rebreather. For partial rebreathers, these generally have a reservoir volume between 5 or 600 to 1,000 cc's. These generally uh, require flow rates greater than 10 liters per minute and ultimately will end up supplying FiO2s in the range of 40 to 70 percent. Non rebreathers are what are typically seen when we're pre oxygenating patients in preparation for intubation, and these typically require flow rates greater than 10 to 15 liters and will ultimately supply an FiO2 in the range of 60 to 80%. Again, neither type of rebreather, whether it's a partial or non-rebreather with reservoir system, is going to provide 100% FiO2. And the reason for this is that we still, or patients, will continue to entrain air around the mass, which if you've ever seen them, they're not very well-conforming masks. Now, one last point about reservoir systems is that one of the major benefits of these devices is that it allows gas exhaled in the initial phase of expiration to return to the reservoir bag. And in a previous episode, we talked about dead space ventilation and the fact that we need to account for this when we're considering someone's alveolar ventilation. When you think about it, the air that's initially expired or exhaled during a breath is that amount of gas that's sitting in the tracheobronchial tree in that anatomic dead space and is undergoing no gas exchange whatsoever. So the gas that's rebreathed is essentially rich in oxygen and largely devoid of carbon dioxide. Now, the patient can inhale room air through the exhalation ports on the mask, but the gas in the reservoir bag is under positive pressure and inhalation ultimately will draw primarily from gas in the bag. And so having that reservoir is so helpful in terms of improving the FiO2 or concentration of oxygenation that's being inspired. The major difference between partial rebreathers and non-rebreathers is that with non-rebreathers, there's essentially a one-way valve between the reservoir bag and the mass that allows inhalation of gas from the bag, but prevents exhaled gas from entering the bag to prevent rebreathing of exhaled gas. Now, we've talked quite a bit about the oxygen concentrations and how the final FiO2 is ultimately determined and stated that the patient's peak inspiratory flow rate together with the oxygen flow rate will ultimately determine the final FiO2. But I don't want you to get too caught up on this. I think the most important thing here 
is that when a patient is having or experiencing acute respiratory failure, we do want to recognize that immediately and obviously intervene, typically in the form of supplementary oxygenation. And the key thing here is we must assess the response to oxygen therapy. In general, you'll hear me say this time and time again, among critically ill and sick patients, we typically, when it comes to interventions, want to start low and go slow. Now, if a patient's in overt respiratory failure with high inspiratory demand and increased work of breathing, this is probably one of those few situations where you want to go big or go home. So in these patients, right off the bat, you want to supply them with a high FiO2 or with a form of oxygen supplementation delivery system that will be able to help offset some of the work of breathing. So this is not going to be a nasal cannula in someone who's chugging away with a minute ventilation of 20 liters per minute using accessory muscles. These are patients who you probably want to immediately get on some sort of a face mask with or without a reservoir system, reassess the response, and then titrate down accordingly. Regarding ideal oxygen targets in hospitalized patients, excluding patients with ARDS and those that are receiving invasive mechanical ventilation, in general, we're targeting for O2 saturations of 92%. Now, given that a pulse oximeter may have an error of about 2 to 4%, uh, plus or minus, in general, then, we're looking at SATs between 88 to 96%, which translates into PAEO2s of approximately 55 millimeters of mercury, upwards of 75 millimeters of mercury. And provided that we're using pulse oximetry properly, it can provide us with invaluable information and alert us to when there's been a significant deterioration in a patient's condition. And this is one of the reasons why it always bothers me when I walk through the hospital or the ICU and I look at a patient's monitor, they've got SATs of 100% and they're receiving nasal cannula supplemental oxygen. And again, because of the flatness of the upper portion of the O2 hemoglobin dissociation curve, a patient with a saturation of 95 or 100% while receiving oxygen therapy may incur considerable deterioration in the respiratory function, yet exhibit minimal decrease in oximetry. And so the whole point of that conversation is just to say that we want to use oxygen therapy conservatively, particularly when patients aren't in the throes of acute respiratory failure. And always remember that the enemy of good is better. And particularly among critically ill patients, they don't have to look or be perfect. Well, that brings us to the end of today's rounds. If you like what you're hearing, I would invite you to share your positive comments with me on iTunes. And please do share the show with your friends and colleagues. Until next time, stay safe, keep reading, talk soon.